In horror movies, we often see the protagonist capture some bizarre spirits through the camera lens, yet is unable to see them with the naked eyes. The camera is like an invisible wire connecting the world of the living and the dead, becoming a passage for communication between humans and ghosts. And the three stories we will talk about today come from a friend working in a TV station. She said that ever since she started his internship, she has frequently encountered many supernatural experiences during filming. And every time we recall them, it sends chills down her spine. If you are also interested in true creepy stories and want to hear more, remember to hit the like button and subscribe to my channel to support me. I will share authentic Asian oddities every Saturday night. Let's go! My college major and current jobs are both related to TV making, so I used to hear my senior classmates say that cameras and such can easily offend spirits. But I hadn't personally encountered anything strange, so I didn't take it seriously. Until the following incidents happened, which made me gain a newfound respect and awe for the supernatural. For my graduation project, I collaborated with some classmates to shoot a documentary. It was all about a young girl from a rural family who got leukemia. Her parents couldn't afford the expensive medical fees, plus they still had to pay for her brother's schooling. We chose this topic because we felt it was meaningful, and also because we planned to screen it at school to try to raise some money for her. The filming took nearly half a year. During this time, the girl's condition was managing to hold steady. The doctor even said she was relatively lucky since she really had infections or other complications. And in other words, her chances of being saved were fairly good. She could basically be cured as long as there was money for treatment. So we didn't think negatively and kept filming. After wrapping, everything seemed normal. Since filming took a long time, we had to rush the editing process. And there were six of us, taking turns in pairs to edit. That night, it was me and another girl I call her Yanzi. We were splicing the footage together, and it was already past 2 am. I was tired and asked Yanzi if she wanted to step out for a smoke break. We headed to the bathroom to smoke, and after finishing up, I went into one of the stalls to pee while Yanzi waited outside. I don't usually glance left or right when I'm in there, but that night, somehow I looked down under the partition on the right side, and that one glance nearly scared me half to death. There was a little girl's food down there. How could there possibly be a young girl on the college campus this late at night? I immediately freaked out and rushed back out. Seeing Yanzi, I asked if anyone else had gone into the bathroom besides me. She denied. And I was totally shaken. She kept asking what happened, and I said nothing, maybe I saw it wrong, then headed towards the pantry to get some coffee, though my mind was full of that little girl's food. And when we got to the pantry, the water wasn't boiled yet, so we waited. By now, I had calmed down a bit and whispered to Yanzi to tell her what I saw. Yanzi is a pretty brazen type of girl. As soon as she heard, she laughed. You mean you saw the girl's ghost? You're crazy. That poor girl isn't even dead yet. I felt her words were a little disrespectful, so I didn't respond. Soon the water finished, and Yanzi went over to get some. Usually, the water flow is very weak, with classmates always complaining that it is even slower than someone spitting. But at that night, the flow suddenly became very strong, scalding her hand badly and it instantly turned red and swollen. The situation was urgent, so I forgot about the early incident and we rushed to the bathroom to wash her hand under cold water. After rinsing a bit, the pain seemed to have subsided. Wanting to keep on schedule with the editing, we headed back to the edit suite. But as soon as we entered, we were stunned speechless. The computer had crashed, and the footage was frozen on a shot of the young girl lying in her hospital bed. I remember we filmed this part when she suddenly developed a high fever, and doctors rushed to help. And seeing the cameras, she had given us a weak smile. So the image frozen on the screen with a girl's pale face smiling faintly at us. And because of what had just happened, I feel that frozen image was a bit creepy. But no matter what we tried, we couldn't get the computer working again. In a panic, I just turned the power off directly. When we turned it back on, the entire section about the girl was gone. Anyone familiar with video editing knows one of the cardinal rules is to continuously save as you edit. There's no way we will make such a basic mistake. And even if we did forget to save, the video would still be queued up to the last save point. It was quite bizarre that the whole section about the smiling girl had just vanished into thin air. 
Finally, we had no choice but to pull up the original source clips again for re-editing. But there seemed to be issues with the raw footage of that section too. Either there was weird pixelation on the video, or the girl's dialogue audio was unclear. Right then, Yanzi and I both felt something fishy was going on, so we decided to call it a night. The next day, we told the other teammates what happened. One of them, who I'll call Xiao Yi, suggested we call the girl's father to ask if he could reshoot some supplemental footage. But when she picked up the phone, the girl's dad sighed and said she had developed another high fever eight days ago, which the doctors couldn't save her from. In her final moments, she kept saying she wanted to thank us for trying to save her life. And coincidentally, there's a traditional belief in China that the deceased can return in spirit form on the seventh day. And yesterday just happened to be the 7-day memorial after the girl's death. Xiao Yi knew a bit about such folk beliefs and suggested we pay our respects at the girl's tomb. So we bought some, pic so we bought some picture books and Barbie doll and went to visit her grave, which didn't even have a proper tombstone yet, just a small burial mound given her young age. Strangely, after we returned from the girl's home, the problematic raw footage was restored back to normal. However, some shots were still missing, including that frozen frame of the girl's smiling face when the computer crashed. After that, none of us ever brought up the incident again. Maybe in our hearts, we were all silently blessing the little girl, hoping she could find some happiness in heaven. After graduation, I started working on legal affairs TV programs, often dealing with cases involving homicide, adultery killings, murder cover-ups, and body dumping. I didn't feel anything was wrong with that. For me, the more horrible thing was working overtime. Sometimes when working late into the night, I ended up not going home for safety. Instead, I would watch horror movies at the office until dawn. Over time, I was becoming more and more bold, but the story I'm about to tell next really frightened me. It happened on another late night when I finished editing around 3 a.m. My co-workers and I started watching the movie in the office. About halfway through, I stepped out to go to the bathroom. And in the instant when I closed the stall door, through the gap, I caught sight of a person passing by the bathroom entrance. It was a woman with short hair. And when I came out, I saw her standing in front of the window back to me. I found it a bit odd since I had never seen this woman before. But considering this is a huge broadcasting company, not knowing every colleague was normal. However, when I finished washing my hands and turning around, that woman had vanished. All I heard was a faint groaning sound. I don't scare her easily, but for some reason, I felt on the verge of tears as I half crawled, half dashed back to the office. One colleague saw me rushing back in panic and asked what was wrong. Terrified, I told them about the woman I had seen. Just then, a veteran reporter asked me to describe what she looked like. I said I didn't get a very clear look, but she had a short hair. Then he asked, was she rather petite and thin? I wondered how he could possibly know this. Surely a grown man wouldn't be peeking at me in the bathroom. He casually replied, well, just a word of advice to you young girls. If you're working late nights, best not to use the washroom on this floor. This immediately piqued our curiosity. We gathered around, begging him to tell us if something had happened here before. Then the veteran reporter shared with us the whole story from years ago. Around five years back, there was a well-known female host at the station who was very competent and quite close with the deputy director. She was riding high in those days. But one day, she suddenly divorced her husband. And right after the divorce, she got promoted by the deputy director to be the head of one of the channels. So many people suspect there was some relations behind the scene. Not long after, the station was going to jointly organize a big award gala with a famous brand. But right after signing the sponsorship contract, the female host unexpectedly committed suicide by jumping off the building. The location she jumped from was none other than the washroom on our seventh floor. Of course, those of us who joined later would not have seen this host before, and the veteran reporter described her as petite with a short bob and very astute, high-achieving looks, never imagining she missed such a tragic end. However, the story doesn't end there. Not long after I joined, we got a new female co-worker everyone called Lulu. She was an inherently timid girl who spoke softly, gentle, and easily frightened, so we all took extra care for her. One colleague who knew a bit about reading faces said 
Lulu's personality type tended to have innate vital energy deficiency. In other words, she was prone to have supernatural encounters. Considering this, I decided to tell her about my washroom ghost encounter as a friendly heads up. But Lulu actually thought I was deliberately trying to scare her. One day, Lulu and I were both working overtime. After what I went through, I now make sure to leave the office promptly by 8 p.m. Before heading out, I specifically urged Lulu to go home early too, but she thought nothing of it. However, she didn't show up at the company again after that night. Later, it turns out she had quit. A long while after her resignation, Lulu contacted me asking to meet up for a meal, saying thanks for the warning. When I saw her again, she seemed to be slimmer. She then explained her reason for quitting. Apparently, after I left that evening, she continued working past 11 p.m. At one point, she used the washroom and all was normal at first, but then she kept hearing knocking sounds from the next door over. Thinking the occupant may need toilet paper, Lulu responded. The knocking stopped, but no one replied. And Lulu bent down to peek under the partition, but the stall was empty. Remembering my experience, she grew frightened and rushed out to hurry back to our office suite. Our building has a peculiar cylindrical architecture from the outside, so there are winding corridors on the interior. Despite the indirect route between the bathroom and office, it was a path we traversed dozens of times daily. But poor Lulu somehow got lost along that all-too-familiar passage, unable to find her way back no matter how she tried. Extremely unnerved, Lulu started crying while cursing as she wandered around fruitlessly for half an hour, still unable to locate our office. Eventually, she decided to take the stairwell up a level to get her bearings. But bizarrely, no matter how many flights of stairs she climbed, the floor number still showed 17. The last memory Lulu has is the blended sounds of a woman wailing and weeping from the stairwell hurtling towards her. Then she passed out. It was the next morning when the cleaning auntie discovered her collapsed along that little bathroom passageway. After the auntie shook Lulu awake, without a word, she bolted from the building got into her car and drive home. Lulu said, the whole drive, it felt like an out-of-body experience as she watched herself from the back seat. She saw a short-haired woman sitting in the driver's seat, operating the vehicle. But no matter how intensely Lulu stared, she couldn't make out the face of that female driver. In utter shock and confusion, Lulu pleaded, where are you taking me? The short-haired woman calmly replied in standard Mandarin, we're going home back to our home. And shortly after, Lulu got into a solo crash, ramming straight into the road divider barrier with a car skewed atop it. The doctor said she was quite fortunate with just cracked ribs and no organ damage. But ever since, she would run low fevers nightly. Her dreams always consisted of that short-haired woman repeatedly telling her, that deputy director is a scumbag. Get yeah, well soon, little girl, so we can kill him together. After several straight nights of these intense nightmares, Lulu couldn't take it anymore. She asked the spiritual healer for help. The master determined the female spirit had an extremely strong will. She must have been quite a formidable woman in life as well, dying with much injustice and resentment, still wishing to exact vengeance after death. So her soul had been trapped there, lying in wait for a chance to possess someone for escape. Like we said, Lulu's energy was weak, making her an easy target. Eventually, the master left Lulu with a protective talisman under her pillow and a pitchful sword. Only then did the nightmare cease as she gradually recovered physically. However, stepping foot in that station again was out of the question. She didn't even resign personally in the end. Her father handled it for her. We have a colleague in our team named Ting Ting, which means delicate in Chinese. But she's not teeny at all. At over 1.7 meters tall and 150 pounds, she works diligently with a kind of handsome brilliance. One day, her team took on a business trip out of the town. When they returned after three days, the director had a sullen expression without even a greeting, immediately heading home after setting his stuff down. And Ting Ting also seemed unhappy too. Ting Ting and I were on good terms, so I took the chance to ask her what happened. What happened to your director? Did you trick him off or something? As soon as Ting Ting heard this, she erupted in complaints. Why would I provoke him? It's his old age dementia making him take it out on me. How is that my fault? She then meticulously tell me everything. 
the director was leading coverage on a fraud case this time. The case itself was with no oddities. They quickly packed up and departed for the incident location in the mid-afternoon. Originally, the director had already reviewed the script with Tintin in the car ride over and gotten her acknowledgement. But the filming process kept running into problems. At one point as Tintin was framing a shot on the street, the director suddenly shouted over. Who told you to shoot this world? I said to shoot the wee fields next door. Tintin was baffled, thinking to herself, that's exactly what you instructed me to film just now. But as a camera operator, she had to obey the director's orders no matter what. So without a word, she proceeded to pan over and shoot the weight field instead. But just then, the director billowed again. I want tracking shots, tracking shots! Now Tini was even more dumbfounded. She yelled back. I was about to do a tracking shot earlier and you shoved me from behind, not letting me to move the camera. And so the two dissolved into open confrontation. One accusing the other of not following instructions, and the other accusing him of nonsensical direction. Just then, the policeman who had accompanied them on the trip seemed to recall something. He hurried over and mediated. Alright, alright, I think it's gotten rather late anyhow. Let's call it a day and pay back up tomorrow morning. I will help you guys to find another location to shoot. With an outsider present, they didn't want to continue the row, so they hastily wrapped for the day. After dinner, the director and Tintin retreated back to the hotel to rest, but not long after Tini had leaned down, she heard a knock at her door. It was almost midnight. It couldn't be the hotel staff. Maybe the director? She called out. I'm trying to sleep. We can discuss whatever it is tomorrow. The knocking actually ceased. Tini rolled over to resume her slumber. However, right as she dusted off, another barrage of knocks came from the director again. Extremely irritated, Tintin snapped. Exactly what do you want? A male voice outside responded. I want to check the footage you shot today. Annoyed, Tintin said. Already told you, tomorrow is too late. But the man insisted. I can't say it tomorrow. I need to watch it now. Still upset about earlier quarrel, Tintin raised her voice in frustration. Do you even know what time is it? I need to rest. If you want to screen dailies, that'll have to be tomorrow. Then she was met with silence. But within minutes, her room phone started ringing. It was the same male voice demanding her tapes. Tintin had enough. She tore into the collar with a string of profanities before slamming down the receiver. Sitting there fuming at the audacity, she dialed up the director's room to confront him over his harassment. But the director denied everything. He said he was watching TV all night and didn't even leave the room, not to mention knocking on her door or calling. Finally, he suggested Tintin was holding a grudge about the quarrel, so look for any excuse to antagonize him. Overwrought with weeping anger, Tini even considered resigning. The next morning, they returned to reshoot at a new venue, and nothing strange occurred. But the unresolved tensions between the director and camera operator were palpable in the icy silence as they wrapped up and headed back to the office. At the end, Tini still vented her frustration about the director to me. That guy acts all proper on the outside. Who knew he would have such vulgar behavior? Shame on him! It was my place to meddle in disputes between colleagues, so I simply gave some token advice before heading home. But I had barely made it down the street when Tintin caught, extremely flustered. I'm finished. After that huge fight, he must be considering firing me, and now there are issues with the footage I shot. Clear negligence on my part. Like I said, Tintin and I were on good terms. Seeing this, I looked back to the office to see what was happening. The problematic shots were from when they had quarreled on the location. It was supposed to be empty landscape. Sprawling wheat fields, a long snaking village path, swinging tree leaves, and so on. But strangely enough, layered discreetly into every clip was a figure of a man. In the wheat field, it was his distant back view. Along the trail, it was a walking silhouette. Even in close-up cutaways, you could vaguely make out the form of a man peering toward the camera off in the far background. It was all too bizarre that both camera operator and the director failed to notice someone so blatantly present the whole time. But considering it was supplemental shooting, perhaps the intrusion wasn't worth harping on too much. I tried reassuring Tintin before sending her home to rest. However, the next morning when I got to the office entrance, I could already hear Tintin yelling at the top of her voice. I've put up with you long enough, who do you think you are? The director screamed back just as angrily. You are the camera operator but couldn't even capture the shots I wanted. Do you understand what is your responsibility? 
face flushed, tinting hollered. Just because I didn't open my door for you in the middle of the night, right? Was that necessary? You're married and kids are all grown up and you still have no shame. Having to work with you every day already makes me sick. Just go right to the leadership so I can quit. Tinting stormed off. I hurriedly followed to meet it. In the stairwell, she bumped the smoke from me while weeping and recounting everything that transpired earlier that morning. The director had reviewed the previous empty landscape tapes. Only now, the illusion male figure captured in the vista was no longer an instinct figure like yesterday. He appeared larger, clearer, more visible than before. And because of him, the whole segment was useless now. Of course, any director would surely question the camera operator for such a big, big mistake. As expected, Tintin refused to back down either, questioning why the director himself didn't spot the stranger on location, and so the brawl erupted once again between the two. I was totally shocked, asking, so what was exactly what's going on in that footage? That guy seemed pretty small when we were seeing it yesterday. How did they become so prominent all of a sudden today? Tintin was equally baffled. <sighs> Beats me, I have no idea why he changed to this. Then we returned to the edit suite to review the tapes again. Horrifyingly, not only were the male figure now large and distinct, the visuals were also corrupted by mosaic pixelation and magnetic interference. I summoned the director down to observe this as well, persuading him it was actually a technical glitch, unrelated to Tintin's ability. Besides, there was supplemental footage that could replace it instead, even you can contact the local police officer to arrange reshoots. However, after the director got off the call with the authorities, he didn't say another word. Later, I noticed he even had the editors completely remove that entire long sequence. I didn't think much more of it, assuming the issue was settled. But a week later, Tinin told me she had entangled by ghosts. Turns out, when the director ran up the place afterwards asking to redo the shoot, not only did they refuse to facilitate, they indirectly hinted the crew best not to return at all to that location for any reason. After some nudging, they finally revealed that abnormalities with the footage were to be expected, because that we felt had been a passing dumping ground for the dismembered corpse of a murdered man, a case still unsolved to this day. In hindsight, after calming down, Tintin realized the male voice outside the door that night didn't match the director's voice at all. As for who that man was, I think we've all understood clearly. Eventually, Tintin personally apologized to the director and he chose not to hold it over her anymore either. With the occurrences being far too bizarre and eerie, everyone tacitly agreed to refrain from ever bringing up again afterwards. Okay, that's all for today, but actually the narrator has shared with me 5 stories and I chose the most horrifying 3 and the rest will be shared in the next episode. Maybe. Thanks to all the brave viewers for accompanying me on this journey. If any of you have supernatural experiences, feel free to share them in the comments. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more spine tingling stories. Until next time, bye bye.